a thousand miles worth of racing and it'll probably be done in less than nine hours but we're about to find out because the green flag's about to fly oh and you saw Janae get a little loose as he comes down the hill to the front straight away the green flag waves here we go McNish already on the charge look at John Field he's looking for a way by one of these diesels that's he gets it side by side up through turn one hairy stuff John Field the man on cold tires McNish looking, looking on the 08, trying to find a way around Montigny. John Field, oh, he's oh, got the him. black and orange, he's gotten him. The black and orange 37, McNish has gotten past Montigny. Field up to third in the black and orange Lola, the number 37. What a move by Alan McNish. These diesel cars, Dorsey, are really twitchy on cold tires, but McNish totally... As you know, now closing in on the gearbox of Chris Dyson. Look at this, the battle coming into the breaking zone. Met and McNish beginning to close in on Janae in front. We said it was going to be a fight from the beginning, and no one is hungrier for redemption than Alan McNish. No, he is a fierce competitor, and he really wants this victory here. He probably all year has been thinking about that little spin that he had under caution last year. Essentially cost Audi their 10th consecutive victory at this remarkable race. He wants redemption here today. Definitely off on the, uh, like what you were talking about before, Calvin, with the Porsche Spider, it's way off on straightaway speed. Something wrong there. It was a pass. This was just a lap ago. It was Frank Montagny who worked his way past McNish. McNish now trying to hold on a little further back. You saw the other Audi of Fessler trying to get around John Field and already into GT traffic. Look at Montagny. He's now come alive. It seems like his tires have now got up to temperature. Dorsey, we saw him weaving around early on. He has a lot more experience, and we see little wisps of smoke there. That means they're running really rich with that diesel as he powers down that straightaway. It's almost like a boost control. You can get a bit more power out of that engine. And Dr. Ulrich was right. It only took three laps for these guys to come into the back of the field and start lapping through. Montagny already on the back wing of Mark Genet in the 0-7. You can tell the difference between the two cars when you watch them come towards you. 07 the dark mirrors 08 the white colored mirrors and you see McNish in the background Marcel Fazler has gotten past John traffic playing a role in the race today it already has Alan McNish has worked his way past Frank Montagny in traffic and you can see the leaders working right now we said a few laps it only took six laps to get to the lead in GT2 let's take a look McNish onto the front straightaway wow and there's a real gaggle of all three together Montagny looks to the end <laughs> to the inside and oh, it's uh, actually Janae yeah. that goes from first to third yeah, but you know I think Janae was smart there he just saw this all coming he lets it happen he doesn't even make an attempt to turn in it's just too early in the race oh, oh he hits him oh, McNish tagged the rear end of Montagny there as they go into turn one just as I was saying it was too early in the race <laughs> <laughs> so it's Montagny to the lead McNish to second Janae says you know what I think uh, this is a long race I'm not going to have any of this right there. Doing oh, anything in a trouble. problem for the number nine. Marcel Fessler is off the road. He's been through the gravel trap and safely will re enter the racetrack. It's on the braking zone for the chicane. He's he gone down. straight, kept out of the gravel trap, oh, and kept on the grass areas. One of the Peugeots comes up to get around him. And this is one of the problems we've seen when the Audi goes off the road or drops the wheels. It's like you talked about earlier, Calvin. That was for position right there. That was for the second spot on the road. Fessler with his mistake. Adverts us up to second in the first of the Peugeots. Really surprised that the Audi didn't make a pit stop when that off was right before pit in just to have things checked out. Because if something happens now, it's a long way home, isn't it? Well, the thing is interesting is what called Fessler to go off the road. Is it traffic that comes down into the braking zone for 10A? We'll find out. It's down there. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Misjudged the speed of that challenge car. Didn't get out of his way. And then suddenly couldn't cut to the inside. His only option was to stay straight, Dorsey. What a great decision on his part, though, Dorsey, to say, look, yeah. I'm going to go drive off the road. He That's expected that challenge car to turn into the apex much quicker and be out of his way. He was still there and suddenly had to make that an issue. Or something got up in the brake road or rock or something got up there and it had the right front. Oh, not able to turn. Look at this. The 0-8. Alan McNish having a good run back to Road Atlanta for Petit Le Mans and there is high drama here. Yes, that is a destroyed R15 plus, well the front end of it anyway. Andre Lotterer has had a massive moment and this is not good at all. Let's show you what happened while we're in the break. Dorse, uh, talk us through. Watch, coming down the hill on the outside, dirty part of the racetrack. This is the third tub that's about to been destroyed by hitting those curbs. Now that is a weak spot in the Audi that needs to be addressed. 
Look at that. I mean, it's completely gutted the front of this car. I don't personally think they'll be able to fix this because they've had to send for a car that Calvin talked about earlier in the show to replace the tub of the last one that got hurt like this. There's been radio communication from the team from uh, engineer Lena Gard asking Andre firstly if he was okay and then for a report on the car they could see from, from our images as to the extent of the damage if Andre can get the car back to pit road which is highly likely the case then a full investigation oh, and assessment will follow. Pits are now open we understand and the debris is being scattered from that R15 plus car number nine. Saw the rear view mirror fly off a big chunk of body work out there on the main straightaway as well now. We only got to see it once, but how far over was he on that curb? Did he get it dead center? Yeah, he did. He split it with the front tires, and it just that the curbing just literally just ripped the hole underneath. Calvin Fisher, of course, was talking about that at the beginning of the show that, that they, the way these are put back together, they had trouble with their carbon fiber molds not coming out exactly the same way. So they've made the whole under tray of that aluminum. Well, that aluminum, of course, as you see, well, look at replay now, you'll see he'll split that curb right down the center. It is and just bang on, completely isn't it? destroys the tub. And as you saw, Lotterer pull the carts into the top of pit road. Pit in. Brad Kettler, American Brad Kettler, was there to meet him, saying, "In here, behind the fence, we're going straight to the hauler, and we, so all of us can get hands on and work on that car and try and get it back out." It was placed fourth at the time of the incident. And the You're reaction just... from Andre Lotterer says it all. This is a young man, a very talented German driver who is in his first full um, year. Great challenges here in this country. We've got to uh, reduce carbon emissions. It would be great to use less uh, foreign imported oil. And how are we going to do that other than through innovation and technology uh, and actually being optimistic about where we can go with technology. And I think uh, the Green Racing Series just helps us do all of that. Back to racing, speaking of that, and Anthony Davidson leads Dindo Capello and Stefan Zarazen. Peugeot, Audi, Peugeot, one, two, three, and Davidson is running high on spirit and on confidence at the moment. Dorse, after that magnificent win in the Le Mans series finale, Silverstone, the first round of the Intercontinental Le Mans Cup just a few weeks back, so he uh, really wants to keep that on a roll. Dindo Capello, the only Audi in between that Peugeot sandwich, if you will. The one thing you really can notice between the two cars when they go down the straightaway, the Peugeot's once again really blowing the black smoke out the sides. On both sides, you see the exhaust, meaning that they're really running a lot of horsepower through the turbo TDI on those. Can we get back up and keep an eye on Sarazen? He's looking to mount a move on Dindo Capello. Is he close enough? Yes, he is. He pulls out of the draft and he hits him. Stefan Sarazen hits Capello and turns himself around in the process. Wasn't clearly long side all enough, and then Dindo turned in and they made contact. Now, and did it do much damage that will require another pit stop? Doesn't look to have. And at three hours into the race, they're the kind of moves that frustrate team leaders and program managers. It's the first flying lap of a restart. They say, think about it and think carefully. Be 100% sure about those moves. Let's take another look from high above and pick through the finer points of this move. Dorsey C, did he do the right thing? Did he do the wrong thing? You kind of saw him think twice about it. He didn't. He looked like he was going back way. Now he goes in, but shallow entry to the corner. And, and Dindo just really, I don't think knew he was in there. Certainly wasn't squared off alongside of him enough to where he could see it. Again, this is a better view of it. Watch now. The last minute he decides, yeah, I can do it, so I'm going to go in there. Dindo's already committed from turning from the outside. Contact made. The scores that sports car, endurance sports car racing is a team sport, and the human element really comes into play. We go back to racing. And Pedro Lamy has a nice advantage as we go back to green. Look at Tom Christensen trying to push his way through, and that's the sister Audi as well. Benoit Trellier, as he navigates traffic very effectively. Well, it looks like TK has got around that Peugeot, so that's a factor right there. Remember, Lamy didn't Ooh, fit. Oh, Tom Christensen. Close very close there with that GTC car, but Christensen, he took tyres. Remember, the Peugeot we just passed did not. Remember, in the driver's meeting, Bob Barfield said, if there's a prototype incident and the GT car goes spinning off, I'm going to pull you in and you're going to sit there. Tom Christensen said, no, I don't want any part of that. Thank you. And you've seen it on two occasions in the last 10 minutes that Tom is being very, very cautious around GT traffic. And that's good heads-up driving. 
Well, that's the reason he's won eight Le Mans, because Absolutely. he really knows how to execute one of these long-distance races. Yeah, that with no bottom on the rim side, that side of the car is going to have tremendous <laughs> lift. It's going to be ugly. I would, I, would not, I would not do that decision. I would fix it. TK, Tom Christensen out in front right now, but in hot pursuit. Mark Janay right behind him, understanding the 16, the Dyson Racing entry, having a problem. It'll be interesting to see if they can get back on track. The word from pit lane, not good right now. They're done for the day, actually. They cannot fix whatever the problem was or is in the 16, so they are uh, officially out. As Dyson was saying some type of a driveline issue is what he thought when he radioed it in. Coming to the pits, Tom Christensen. Still leading, but now this is where the traffic comes into play. One of the things that you were just talking about a little while ago, Calvin, was controlling the traffic in front of you and behind you, slowing up your competitors so you can get the run off the corner. TK, an expert at this. Yeah, he's really done a masterful job here today. We saw it a little while ago in the break with uh, Janae right behind him, and Tom just parked the car coming down into turn five to allow a GTC car to get through there, and he just accelerated off the corner without being blocked. So he's really using his rear view mirrors at the same time as looking forward, Dorsey. Yeah. and reading this traffic. If you're in the second place car and, and you see some uh, back markers up ahead, you back away so you can get the run. If you're in the lead car and you see the behind, guy behind you got the run, you just park him. And that's what Christensen did. And these are the leaders right now because Pedro Lamb, we stopped just a three laps ago for fuel. And so these now guys assume the lead. So Christensen leads from margin A second in the 07 Persia. And that's not dirty driving. That is smart driving. That's just reading the race and watch it right here you've got the eight in front the Drayson racing entry. Again. TK slows up a little bit at the entry to get the runoff so, but so did Janae will he have a run on Christensen well they still got to deal with the eight car don't they that's just it but it's a GTC oh look at that Janae wow. had to hit the anchors there Dorsey and what it does it throws all the aero balance to the front and immediately the rear got twitchy on him in the entry to six and that's what I was talking about with the eight car you know they weren't both cleanly by it and they have to deal with it you could see how how bad these cars get loose when you when you put them in an unbalanced situation like that. Grayson behind the wheel of the number eight right now, and he didn't do anything wrong. Holding his line started to turn in. Janae thought, well, I'm going to go, but we saw that same thing earlier, did we not? Indecision. You've got to make the move. If you're going to do it, do it. If you're not, don't even put yourself in the position to get in trouble. Well, I think he had committed to it and then realized there was no gap to go for and just hits the brakes even harder right there. Just got really twitchy. He locks it up, even in a high-speed corner like six. Now he comes back at Christensen. This is for the lead, heading up into three. And they've got more traffic in front. That is a very familiar tune, to say the least. Now, you can sweep around the outside of a GTC car there, but from here on down to turn five, you're pretty much stuck. And there's the 44. Look at Christensen again. Parks back it. way off to get the run. And I tell you what, Dorsey, this is mentally exhausting. These cars are physically hard to drive, but when you're stinned, is really knotted up with this having to read the traffic i mean you are really on your toes all of the time yeah, it's an awesome cat and mouse game going on right there with two guys with huge experience i mean they're reading that traffic and they're using it to their advantage that's exactly how you have to run a race like this you know you saw christensen when he realizes he's not going to make the pass on a slower car he parks everybody behind him you have to do it christensen with a good run down into 10a and 10b janae still behind I think Christensen yeah. recognized the fact that Mark Janay does have that experience, Dorsey, that you're talking about, and he feels that he's going to give him a good, clean race. So I don't think he's too worried about some Banzai move by Janay coming down the inside. He thinks about it. He's going to recognize the language that Christensen has given him in terms of slowing him up before the corner. And, Calvin, you've run races against guys like this before. And, and when, it, when it happens to you, okay, first, you're frustrated. But second, I smile because I'm going, that was good, man. That was good. <laughs> I will get you back for that. Christensen. The one who has to fight through traffic, Janae getting caught up right now. It was Dindo Capello behind the wheel of the seven a little bit earlier. He had a great run with the Peugeots as well. Tell the truth. Uh, <laughs> actually started in uh, the fall of 97. And uh, Lane Berto and I were at Sebring. And uh, I, I, I had been with him in Japan, and he was the technical director for the ACO. Wow. And, and uh, I said two Peugeots just bumped each other. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I don't know if this is what you had planned to create, but what you've created is some intense racing as you watch that restart. Two right. Peugeots getting together at the start. What you've created, Dr. Don, is pretty impressive stuff. Manufacturers from all around the world 
coming to race here. As you see right now, Zindo Capello holding on to the point over the 08 with Frank Montagny behind the wheel. And then the 07, Alexander Burks got shuffled back. But back to 1997. Yeah, it was in the fall 97. I said, look, uh, we need to do some racing with stable rules. And uh, I said, we'd like to do a deal with the ACO and run a Petit Le Mans at Road Atlanta. And from that, uh, I just ended up buying the track. And uh, from there we went and cut the hill away and put it on in October. Was it September? October, 97, 98. And the building process began. And here's the process of the Peugeot's trying to get back up front. The 08, Frank Montagny sweeps around the outside of Dindo Capello. And one of the things that we've seen earlier today, seemed like it took the Peugeot's a little longer to get up to speed, Dorsey, with new tires after a restart. But right now, Montagny on a charge. Capello the one holding back a little bit. Yeah, that was that was good top end speed too, running down the hill. And you see these things we've, we've discussed it a lot that the uh, Peugeot's really throwing the black smoke out here this year, meaning they've got the wick turned up. Capello trying to hold on, Montagny pulling out a little bit. Don, when you look back to 1998, the first year that it ran, and, and obviously it was a great turnout. And you had good participation, but as we fast forward for 13 years and we show up. This year, I'm sure you were a little concerned about some of the rain that we had on Wednesday and Thursday. But yeah. the crowd that you have here, and I want to say unexpected, but the pleasure that you see when you look around, you look at the shots from the helicopter, how does that how does that make you feel? What's well, the satisfaction it, level? It makes me feel great. And, you know, the track and Jeff Lee did a great job with all the promotions in the city and around the community and the billboards and the newspaper coverage and chambers of commerce of all the different civic groups in the area. And, you know, it's paid off, and you see the crowd. I don't I don't know how we get any more people in here. And uh, it's really good. And, I, I, you know, I, I, I knew it was going to be good. I didn't know how good it was going to be. Well, I've said it before. I'm a road racing fan from the day I was born. I went through all my career. People want to see road racing. Five bucks for every penalty they got. They'd be making <laughs> some money. Take a look at this. Charges on. And right now, Capello in a good place because he's got the sister car with Benoit Trulier behind him. Trillier right now not fighting for position, but he's oh. doing a good job of holding the Peugeot back a little bit. Benoit Trillier. Got a real good look at the Peugeot with the amount of uh, exhaust coming out of it that time. A discussion point all day about how hard they're running that engine. They've got to turn way up. And the good thing is the more that Montagny has to fight and Gertz has to fight to get past the other Audi, the more Dindo Capello can pull away. Well, you have cheap cars, isn't it? That's exactly <laughs> why. And I can tell you, Trillier will not be easy to get past as Capello tries to work his way through six, seven, and onto the back straightaway. Well, Dorsey, you mentioned that diesel soot coming out of the Peugeot again, and really this stems from the beginning of the year. Peugeot taking a look at what Audi was doing with the R15 Plus, and they were anticipating Audi coming to Le Mans really a lot stronger than they actually did. So the team said, hey, we've got to do a lot of L engine development leading up to Le Mans. And we saw one of the problems with that engine development is the connecting rod failures at Le Mans. They didn't validate those connecting rods, and that's why they failed. But also, a lot of other improvements to that car so that's why we're seeing that smoke and also the engine tone they improved the combustion they reduced the exhaust pressure they really increased the amount of air flowing through that motor and that's another area where they picked up horsepower and torque i can tell you dindo capello needs to get on the horse because right now the three cars behind him are faster than he is and we heard tom christensen say when he got out of the car i had that vibration i wonder if it's gone away for capello so let's take a look this is Trillier a trying to hold them back and look Montagny trying to get to the inside. Wheel to wheel, left front to uh, right rear. And once again, you have to be careful. You have to weigh and look at this. He got it. 08. Montagny gets past, and you wonder if Capello didn't have some type of a problem because he was well out in front, and that was quite a leap for Montagny to get there in that short of time. Does Capello have some type of a problem? Nah. The other cars behind him were a second faster? I just think it, uh, that the, the Peugeot's on an outright... Dindo, box this lap, box this lap, we're ready. They say, Dindo, box this lap. Capello does have some type of a problem. He'll be coming to pit road. So the question is, what is the issue with the 7? Is the vibration still there? As Capello flashes out of 10B and heads straight to the pits. He was talking about not being able to see. Now, I don't know if that's the sun or what we've talked about before with the vibration being so bad that you couldn't see the corner. 
This will cost them dearly, and they need to get whatever service done and get him back out there at the pace that Montigny and Verts are running. Justin. As Dindo came up the pit lane, he was shaking his head towards Allen. Allen literally put his helmet on in about 30 seconds. Now, we'd like to think that perhaps this is as simple as some pickup Dorsey that's on a tire. Maybe they got something from inconsistent. That would cause him not be able to see if he has the sort of vibrations that can come through at the, at the speeds and the load that these prototypes have. Um, the other thing is the other thing is with uh, Alan getting in the car is you know he is like the Scottish ninja and maybe they know they've got to respond to the Peugeot speed they wouldn't have come in for track position obviously but remember there are what quite a few hours left in this race and Alan is capable of a very fast double stint triple stint maybe that was a very clean pit stop and um, they changed tires I believe it is something to do with the tires will obviously time will tell now if Alan has the same problem well, this is what I don't understand. It must be something with the tires. Dindo had a dark visor. McNish has a clear visor. So I don't think it's sunshine or the brightness of the sky that's creating the issue. We'll have to find out. Let's take a look. You see right now, Capello working his way into turn five, backs up a little bit to try to get a run, and then just loses space coming off of turn five. That is exactly where, where you look straight into the sun, though, as you climb that hill. And then it was an easy run for Montigny to drive past as well. And you see Trillier stand, stay behind him to try to... You all just flash the inside. He didn't even think about it. It's not like he had to feel out the situation. So you'd have to assume that Werner was way off the pace there. Hey, guys, I've been listening to the Ray Hall Letterman group, and they've been telling Dirk that the pressures are good. You've got to go. You've got to go now. So I think what you know, they've been seeing is just waiting for those pressures to come up once we went back to green, and now they're telling them, hey, you got to pull the trigger. You can't lose these guys. Well, this is what we've been talking about. McNish needs to get around that Peugeot, and he may need traffic to help him. Traffic is getting thick for Alexander Wurtz right now. We've said it all day long from the drop of the green that traffic and traffic density was going to be an issue. We remember talking to Tom Christensen just the other day, and he said, we're going to be passing three or four, five cars every single lap out here. Now that we've looked at the differential between the lap times from the different classes, it's going to be busy. And right now, Alan Nish gets bottled up just a little bit. Kyle Marcelli does a great job, lets him go. And now more traffic in front of them. And don't forget, these are fast cars. This is your lead pack in GT2. One thing that they've been really working really hard on now, McNish gets a good run through turn one, but it's very tough to pass up there. How forceful will he be? Well, he needs to hit him and take out the left rear taillight. <laughs> <laughs> Not hard, just enough to break the lens, and then it all works his way. More traffic in front. This is the GT2 leader. Getting back to the setup on the Audi, Tom Christensen told us we had a pretty good balance last weekend, but once we got into traffic when all the cars were on the racetrack during the practice sessions, we found a real inconsistency with how the handling was affected in traffic. Oh, look at him close up right there on the back of Verts into seven. Can he get a run? Remember, McNish has already nailed one of these Peugeots in the gearbox once today down in the turn one in the early going, so he's not afraid to mix it up. I don't think afraid is in Alan McNish's dictionary. Down into the braking zone. McNish is going to have to go with him, and he does. Slides inside the BMW. McNish holding on to the back of that Peugeot as they slice through traffic. Well, you've got to be decisive. You've got to make your mark. You've got to let that slower traffic know that you are there. You don't want to be halfway alongside. Get all the way alongside, then get hard on the brakes. We've make seen sure that. he knows. We've seen that multiple times today, Calvin, and you're exactly right. You've got to be decisive. If you're going to do it, do it. McNish. This is great stuff. I mean, this has been a fascinating battle. We saw the smile on Tom Christensen's face when he got out of that race car as he went and had a great deal for a couple of hours with Mark Genet. And now we see two of the other factory di drivers duking it out. We heard Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich say, we're here to win. Anything other than winning is losing. But they're here to race. And that's the thing. And that's the emotion you saw on Tom Christensen's face. These guys... They love to win, but they like to take it. They don't want to have it given to them. They want to race. Well, Audi have won this race nine times in a row from 2000 all the way to 2008. And last year, they really felt they were in the catbird seat. McNish made a very rare error. We had that deluge. And under caution, he spun the car around. The Persians whipped around him. We, we never saw green flag action the rest of the day when the race was called. So they let one slip through their fingers there. McNish would love to redeem himself here this afternoon he's going to give everything he has but this is really the last time we'll have a chance to see these two race cars go head to head here on u.s soil they have one more race in the intercontinental cup over in china of course 
but this is the last time. There's new rules in place for next year. Both Peugeot and Audi have brand new race cars on the drawing board. When we talked to Lamar, they knew that they had to improve that system. They did so. And the big picture at Sebring, at the Mobile One 12 hours of Sebring. Remember, Audi had tried as the white flag flies. Audi tried to run that interim car and Peugeot said they blocked it and said no. So instead, they took the R15 Plus down to Homestead Miami Speedway and tested. Peugeot went on to get victory at this year's Mobile One 12 hours of Sebring. We went on to the 24 hours of Le Mans. Another head-to-head -head clash with the Giants as Lamy and Frank Montagny watch on. They're not far away from victory lane and standing on top of that podium at Lasarth. It was a great head-to-head -head battle, but massive, massive engine dramas for Peugeot, as well as one of the cars had structural damage, and they handed it to Audi. It was a one, two, three for the four rings. However, here on US soil, this has been a fair head-to-head -head fight, and the lion will roar just like it did in Florida earlier in the year. So much on the line here tonight. We talked about Corvette trying to get their first win of the year. Looks like right now they're going to come up a little bit short as Ollie Gavin currently runs second behind Tony Vlander in the Reese cars. So the note on Magnussen, could he get that first win of the year and continue his streak? It's going to come awfully close. Coming to the checkered flag, the Lion does roar again. And another victory in the United States for Peugeot. Frank Montagny and Stefan Sarazen go back to back. And they add their little mate Pedro Lamy to the list as well. And what an accomplishment. Montagny will celebrate with his mates on a fine, fine victory. And what a way to go out. What a way for us to farewell the Peugeot 908 in America.